Hi again, everybody. And now we're going to titrate an acid um, that with three different indicators just to see what our options are. So what I have here is I have a Erlenmeyer flask that's got HCl in it, so hydrochloric acid. I actually don't know what the concentration is. I just dumped a little bit in from another bottle and added some water. So we're all going to have fun and try to figure out what that concentration is. And this time, instead of titrating a solid dissolved in water, like we did with the last titration, I want to titrate a liquid. And so I'm going to take this liquid solution and I'm going to pipette in five milliliters. So one, two, three, four, and here's our fifth. And what I want you to notice is that five milliliters inside the Erlenmeyer flask is not a very large volume. It would be kind of hard to see the titration endpoint just because there's not a lot of liquid here. And so what we do is we add just a little bit of water and that's just to make our lives easier. How much water you wanna know? Well, pro tip from somebody who's been doing this for a while, it actually doesn't matter. I'm just gonna dump some in. All right, that looks like a volume I can handle. I'm happy with it. And so I have two more trials set up. I'm just going to pour a little bit of water in to each of them, and we'll set them up. But here's the deal. The thing that I want you to notice is that I was very careful about the five milliliters I put in at the beginning. So in my notebook, when I'm doing all my calculations, I have five milliliters of HCl solution. That's what matters. It doesn't matter what I added to it afterwards, just the five milliliters that I put in. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a titration with phenolphthalein, just like we did before. So I'm going to take our first trial, and I'm going to put in two drops of phenolphthalein indicator. So phenolphthalein, just like we titrated with before. Here we go. Clear and colorless, right? You want to probably write down your observations as we go. By the way, that's sodium hydroxide. I've done the standardization calculations. And it really did average out to be 0.122 molar sodium hydroxide. So that uh, standardization was good. Somebody must have done it recently. My initial burette reading when I took it was 4.30 milliliters. And you'll be able to prove that to yourself with the pictures that I give you afterward. So let's go ahead and let's put our burette uh, inside of our flask and prepare to titrate. And this is one that again, we shouldn't be super surprised by the result. We've already seen what happens when we titrate with phenolphthalein. At some point, it's going to go from clear to pink. So let's go ahead and see if we go from colorless to pink while I titrate this. So here's my white paper for that extra bit. And here we go. Okay. Getting closer. That color is sticking around just a little bit longer every time. Oh, there it is. And it faded back out. And now it's gone to colorless again. That's normal, actually, with titrations. When you get very near the end point, you get kind of excited about that. I'm going to let that last drop go in. And that should do it. In fact, it definitely does. I'm going to take that final burette reading and I'll post it onto Canvas for you to take a look at but it ends up being 9.25. So I've started at an initial volume of 4.30. I ended at a final volume of 9.25 milliliters. You might wanna jot those notes down because now I wanna try this with a different indicator. Let's try to find out if the indicator is the special thing about the titration or if the acid and the base are the special thing about the titration. But what I mean by that is that if the indicator is magic, if it can automatically find the equivalence point, it ought to change in the same place no matter what indicator we use. That's the hypothesis I want to test. So again, phenolphthalein, I put in phenolphthalein, it started out colorless, it ended up this nice pink, and it took um, starting from 4.3 to 9.25, so it took a total of 4.3, right? It took a total of 4.95 milliliters with the phenolphthalein indicator. 
And that's important, right? Let's see if these other indicators do the same thing. So here is my next trial solution. It's got the same amount of HCL in it, but instead of adding phenylphthalein, I'd like to try a different indicator. It's called methyl red. So methyl red is clearly not the same color as phenylphthalein, it's already red. And when I put it into my HCL solution, let's see what happens. Let me get a couple drops in here. Hopefully I get a reasonable color change. There we go. Look at that. It is already kind of pink, okay? So my observation, my first observation with using a different indicator is that the indicator can be different colors depending on its chemical identity. And so my first observation is that phenylphthalein went from colorless to pink. I'm gonna write that down. We know that this methyl red appears to go from pinkish red to something else. I know that my initial burette reading, by the way, is 9.25 milliliters. I haven't changed anything there. So I know that whatever I ended with, I can start with on the next trial. So here's my methyl red. I'm gonna lower my burette and we're gonna start to look for a color change. So first off, we know the color change is gonna be different, right? We know that it's not going to happen at, um, or it's not gonna to turn to pink because it's already pink. So let's see what the new color is. And let's also see, and I'm gonna push this back a little bit. Let's also see how many milliliters it takes for the color to change. So here we go. I'm adding, add a little bit of sodium hydroxide. The other thing about indicators is we hope that they take a little while to change, right? Otherwise, we didn't design our titration very well. Hey, cool, color change. But this color change is different, right? So I hit my color change and look at it this time. Let's see if I can get my white paper behind it to show you. Not really, you'll have to look in the pictures in Canvas, but I can tell you right now it's kind of a yellowish color, right? That yellowish color apparently happens after adding to a volume of 13.5. So 13.50 milliliters. And if I do my calculation, that was 4.25 milliliters of base added to get to this particular equivalence point. Is that close enough or not? Let's think about this a little bit more and let's try another indicator and see what sorts of stuff happen. So here's our last trial. I've got some HCl, and this time, third indicator, right? We've tried phenylphthalein, we have tried methyl red. The third indicator that I'd like to try is called bromocresyl green. And there's a nice big bottle here, and you can see that it is not green. It's actually blue in this phase. I'm gonna drip it into this HCl solution. I'm gonna put in two drops. One, two, and I think a third for good measure. This isn't quite as concentrated as some of the other indicators that we've looked at. So I'm gonna go ahead and give that a swirl. And we've got this kind of wine yellow, like white wine, yellow grape juice color here right now. So we know that we're starting, and this is HCl, so we know that the pH in this flask is acidic. We're starting at yellow at an acidic pH. So remember that the methyl red indicator started out red and ended up yellow. Bromocresyl green apparently is starting out yellow. Let's see where it ends up. So we're starting at a volume of 13.5 mils. And excuse me, good old spring allergies. Let's go ahead and see what happens as we drip in our sodium hydroxide to this. And I'll show you colors as well as I can as they go. So here we go, dripping in. It's 
but I start to see little bits of blue showing up in here. I love titrations for the colors. They're my favorite. And now it's starting to look a little bit green. You might think about where bromocresyl green gets its name from, and it's probably from that, right? Adding more. Adding still more. It's still pretty yellow, but it's starting to take on a greeny yellow. It's not quite the same yellow anymore. And that's one of the problems with indicators when you're trying to choose them. If you're not very careful, it can be hard to tell where the endpoint is. And bromocresyl green is one of those. If you want to try something like this on your own at home, the next time one of you guys goes out to the grocery store, buy a head of red cabbage. First off, it's really good to cook with and taste pretty good. But second off, pull off a leaf, boil some of the, um, like just stick the leaf in water, boil the water for a little while. You're going to notice that the um, red cabbage water is kind of a bluey green. Just mix it with other random stuff you have in your house. Mix it with bleach from your basement. Mix it with vinegar. Mix it with salt. It's a pH indicator, and you'll see all kinds of colors. Robocresyl green's a little bit like that. It's got kind of a wide range of colors that it can be as we titrate. And I'm going to just keep adding sodium hydroxide. I keep, ooh, there we are. Look at, there's my endpoint. I started yellow, and I ended up blue, all right? Bromocresyl green went from yellow to blue. And the volume that I'm at right now is 18.25 milliliters. So if I take 18.25 mils minus the 13.5 that I started at, I find that it took about 4.75 milliliters of sodium hydroxide to make the bromocresyl green change its color. That's a really big range. I had the lowest volume of um, indicator sodium hydroxide to make my color change for methyl red at 4.25. Seven tenths of a milliliter later is where phenolphthalein changes color. And so there's definitely some discrepancies. And so what I want you guys to think about as you're crunching these data is which indicator might be best for this and why. And so I've got some questions to lead you through that. And then when you finish with those questions, I'm going to give you some more data to try and figure out what's going on with the titration.